Hello and welcome everyone to the Tech Shamit podcast. Today I am here with another special guest, Mr. Deepak Solanki. Deepak is the president and co-founder of the Golden Hope Foundation. By profession, he is serving as an advocate in High Court of Madhya Pradesh. Apart from this, as a social worker with more than a decade of experience in community service, he has worked on various projects at national and international levels. In the previous episode, we had an opportunity to talk with Mr. Devijit Singh. So today we will continue our discussion about the Golden Hope Foundation, where both Deepak and Devijit are actively working together to make a significant impact. But before we dive into our discussion, I'd like to thank Deepak for being here with us. And now I request you to please initiate the discussion by telling us something about yourself and your responsibilities at the Golden Hope Foundation. Thank you so much, Shamit. Uh, it's it's an honor and it's a pleasure uh, to be here and to discuss and talk more about my community service experiences and uh, and talk about the Golden Hope Foundation and. Uh, Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, this was, uh, you know, just to start quickly, uh, I am Deepak Solangi and I am an advocate in the High Court of Madhya Pradesh in Lord Bench. And uh, apart from that, I am deeply into community service. I have been uh, working into, uh, you know, I've been working in community service for a very long time now. Since I was uh, in school, I have been involved into various community service projects at national and international level. And uh, and I, I always had this zeal for doing something good for the society and giving back to the society. And that's what has been inculcated during my school time uh, with, with uh, at Nero. And that, that's how that's how I got more inclined towards community service. Apart from that, how I got to start about, I'll, I'll just quickly tell about how we started the Golden Oak Foundation. It was, uh, again, I was I randomly visited the indoor zoo. That was in 2015, uh, where, I, I, where I had, uh, you know, I had an interaction with the zoo authorities and I also uh, got to know about the, I just witnessed about the conditions that we had in, uh, in in the zoo. So condition of the animals in the zoo. So that is where I got inclined uh, towards uh, working, doing something for the animals of the zoo and, you know, doing something good for the society. Uh, since I was in college, I was not having any active project that, at that particular moment. So I thought of starting up with some, some project. I went to uh, my senior advocate and, uh, I, I talked, I spoke to him, I, I, I said, sir, uh, this is what I saw and was very upset about the conditions of the animals in the zoo. And I believe this is the same state of situation, uh, state, uh, same state of situation, you know, for all, all the animals which are kept in zoo, uh, you know, in, in, in India. There's something that we need to do. So, sir said, why don't you start up, start up with, the, with, the, with your own with the group and then, you know, take your friends and, uh, you know, something smaller group and then you can go on, on a bigger level. So that is how I got motivated to come up uh, to start with a smaller group, and later on, uh, you know, we, we kept on adding on different projects, and that's how we uh, are an NGO now. Okay, okay. So yeah, uh, in the last uh, episode also, we got a chance to speak with uh, Mr. Devijit Singh. We discussed like how you guys are working for the. Uh, welfare of the society so could you please uh, tell us a bit about your responsibility uh, with this NGO like how what all responsibility you are taking care uh, here and how you are working with the team uh, see being the president and being also being one of the co-founders uh, I take it as an overall responsibility for myself that I, sh- uh, that, I, that, I that I'm responsible for for the for majorly for the operational and the, all the activities that are being carried, carried out, uh, you know, under the under the banner of the Golden Hope Foundation. Uh, <clears throat> my roles and responsibility majorly are to take care of the activities, to come up with new activities, to you know, and and also to filter out and to you know approve of the different activities that the other volunteers suggest us, and majorly to take care, to overall take care of the organization and its activities. And also take care of uh, the, the legal part uh, and the and the other uh, operational part that have been uh, you know that are required for the NGO. Okay, okay. So uh, as we know that you have completed various projects through this NGO. So my question is like, how does how does this uh, foundation engage with the broader community and raise awareness about its cause? In today's world. It is quite difficult to do everything by your own. And what I believe that collaborations are the best way 
to engage with the broader community. For example, if I have four people in contact and other person has 10 people in contact, I would definitely contact the other person and, you know, reach out those 10 more people instead of, you know, individually going out. So collaborations and if it's, and the world is working in collaboration, right? No, nobody can survive without collaboration. So that is how, uh, how we engage. We work in collaboration with different NGOs, with different organizations, with different groups of people. We collaborate with them. We talk to them and we discuss about their needs. We talk about that, what we are what we, how we can help them out and that we reach out to them and that is how we are trying to engage ourselves with more collaborations and engage with, with the broader community okay. and uh, as i know like one of your uh, ongoing project focuses mainly on the welfare and uh, conservation of wildlife and the street animals so uh, okay. please tell a bit about this approach like how does this foundation approach this issue and as you mentioned that earlier also that you visited one zoo and then the you inclined toward this motive so what all other uh, initiative you have taken so far for this particular project for this particular project again uh, i i, I uh, like like i said we are working in collaboration so you know we collaborated with indoor zoo and uh, animal rehabilitation and protection front arpf which is uh, another ngo that works with, with which works very closely with the indoor zoo so we collaborated with those organizations. We spoke to them, and the project that we have for for the wildlife and animals uh, is that we wanted. You know, see, we have a lot of animals who are there in the wildlife, and that we have wildlife. Uh, we have laws for the those animals, and they are being kept in a different way. They are living in a natural habitat, but however, in the zoos, the animals are not in their natural habitat, right? But we can make efforts as a society to keep those animals, or to create situations, or create habitats that you know, which could be like somewhere nearby to what, what the natural habitat is. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, as a young guy, I used to go to the zoo with my with my father. Uh, we I saw the animals were the tigers and the lions. They are all, uh, you know, they were kept in cages, right? They were, which was a very small cage and they were kept in those cages and they had no place to move around. And they used to just circle around and it became a very psychological, it affected them very badly, you know, in, in right. a psychological manner that, uh, you know, so it became a, uh, it, that, that small cage became their habitat. However, we, then I spoke to the zoo authority and uh, I thought, I, 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 I saw that, you know, sir, if you could do something for those animals and, uh, you know, the, the, the person, in the, the gentleman at the zoo, he said that, yeah, we're working on such kind of things as well. And we have later on the laws also, the Indian uh, the Indian government also introduced laws that, you know, uh, with, the, uh, with, with, with time, the laws also changed and they introduced laws where, uh, you know, the conditions uh, were more, more, more kind of uh, more, uh, I would say, uh, different uh, things were, uh, you know, different guidelines were given to how to keep the, the animals in the zoo, right? So we uh, we worked with the zoo authorities. We we requested requested them, and they uh, you know they assured that yes we will we will work on the uh, you know the cages and the we'll also work upon the uh, what they call pada in Hindi. So mm -hmm. the it basically it's the it's the uh, it's the area where the animals being kept, and it's uh, so they provided a bigger area with uh, with, with sort of a natural habitat, if not if not. Uh, you know, a complete natural habitat uh, per se. So that is how we got to know. Then we were, we were, and that was the time when we were working closely with the zoo. We used to observe what are the changes that have been needed and we used to give our suggestion to the zoo authorities and also with the uh, ARPA organization. So that is how we worked upon them. And that's how the, and now if you go to the indoor zoo, I think the the, the animals are also living in very good cages. Uh, and I, I, I rather I shouldn't call them cages. They are living in good habitat, actually. Okay. So the conditions have, uh, yeah, have been improved. And uh, I would like to mention about the Bhopal Zoo, the Bhopal, uh, one we are in Bhopal. It is uh, fantastic. It is, uh, you know, the way the animals are being kept. And uh, because that was, that was one, uh, that was the point where I, I, I thought of, you know, this is something where we can actually keep those animals in the zoo. Okay. Okay. So uh, yeah. regarding zoo, like, are you only working specifically for these uh, two zoo, uh, Bhopal or Indore Zoo, or there is any other cities across the India, like uh, where you are in touch with the authorities and you are working uh, for uh, the resolution of their needs? So are you in touch with other uh, group also? 
yes if we are working if we are working in collaborate you know we are working in collaborating with other zoos also however majorly right now we are focusing on indoor zoo and bhopal zoo so that you know bhopal one we are so that uh, once we uh, once we think that this is an ideal uh, place we can you know through the example of these two places we can encourage the other people and now uh, with the new guidelines of the government uh, which which of course they have, it, it, it has been quite some time that after the new guidelines have been issued almost all the zoos in india india are supposed to uh, you know keep the animals in a particular situation and uh, you know like for example there there is a uh, there are specifications for how much the area for the keeping the tiger should be how much the area for keeping the lion should be how much area is for keeping the deer and other animal should be so for each animal there is some specific area that the zoo is supposed to zoo are supposed to follow and these guidelines have been issued by the central zoo authority uh, you know which uh, you know yeah these guidelines and these guidelines actually come under the wildlife protection act okay okay and um, yeah. my next question is uh, somewhere i am going to touch base the question with your professional uh, life also so being an advocate how do you assess the effect in effectiveness of current animal welfare laws in our country mm -hmm. and what areas do you think that we need improvement uh, for those particular laws we have uh, some good laws that are in our country for environment for animal we like if to name some wildlife protection 1972 is is the major law that you know that governs the uh, protection of animals in india it, uh, under that only the i just i just spoke about the central zoo authority and the you know the the guidelines of the central zoo authority that is that also has been covered under the same act and then we also have prevention of cruelty to animals act uh, you know that majorly covers uh, majorly covers the street animals and and the animals the domestic animals also so uh, we have different uh, we have different laws and we have strict rules and laws in india but it is it is more about the awareness people are not aware of those laws i mean people are not even aware of their own rights and their own uh, you know the, the the basic laws that we have in our country so you know leave away the animal protection laws so Uh, awareness is the key and i would always focus that you know we need we need uh, you know the government needs to make people more aware about the laws and i think uh, this doesn't come all of us so uh, the way we are teaching students about our rights the way we are teaching you know the students about about the constitution and about you know about the society in the school time the, the children i mean the, the animal laws could also be included uh, as one of the courses in schools and colleges as well so that uh, at least people understand those laws they get to know about those laws and once they know about those laws once there is an awareness people will be able to follow those laws okay okay yeah uh, you are right like awareness is something that can only solve the issues and challenges of nowadays because uh, there are laws as you mentioned that there are various laws which is uh, for the benefit of the animal uh, welfare itself yes. but if you are not aware of that thing then you you are not uh, in a good state to approach and solve those issues so we should uh, exactly. reach uh, raise the awareness regarding these type of laws okay and uh, apart from this project i think uh, you are also working actively for one of the project that focuses on the women empowerment so could you please tell yes. a bit about that approach like what all step you have taken so far under this particular project so uh, under the women empowerment when we talk about women empowerment women empowerment is a very broad term so i don't uh, i or our ngo does not uh, you know We we don't actually uh, get into you know like na narrowing down this women empowerment term into for just one one particular thing. However, uh, as under the under the under the umbrella of women empowerment, there is one of the projects that we have taken, and that is about uh, menstrual health and hygiene. Mm -hmm. uh, menstrual health is something that is not really you know that is very less focused upon, especially in the rural areas and remote areas of our country, and uh, menstruation. it's it's still still taken as a taboo uh, you know and uh, we have a lot of uh, you know we have a lot of uh, misconception about uh, you know menstruating women and we have a lot of uh, you know even even say culturally also india has always been uh, since we talk about the ancient times india india has always been one of the most open minded societies and open minded cultures in the world right but somehow 
some somewhere some things got you know misunderstood and that is where some misconceptions develop and uh, which are still affecting the women in india so you know about you know education still don't have a lot. we are still lag, lagging you know behind in 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 you know menstrual you know menstrual health and hygiene and education about it so our project mainly focuses on uh, this thing where uh, we are actually uh, you know we are distribute, distributing sanitary napkins to the uh, girls who do not have access to it because there's a there's still a large section of these society in india uh, which uh, which still does does not have uh, access to uh, you know sanitary napkins they are still using the old uh, methods of you know the cloth and things so we are raising awareness about you know using that how do we carry out this project is something uh, you know we do not just go and distribute sanitary napkins to people and to girls and just say tell them that okay uh, you know from tomorrow onwards you're not going to use cloth and you know, just use start using sanitary napkins no we need to educate them as to what are the benefits of using a you know, sanitary napkin and what are the drawbacks and consequences of using cloth right we what how we carry out our projects is that uh, first we conduct a seminar for those girls we tell them about the consequences of the consequences of cloth and uh, you know uh, the wrong methods and we tell them about the benefits of using a sanitary napkin and other alternatives that can be used instead of a cloth and uh, after that we educate them and of course we have girls in our team so uh, only the girls go and you know since it's a very sensitive matter in india like i told you especially in the rural areas so we have girls who are specially trained for uh, this particular uh, seminar and they go and conduct these kinds of seminar and they interact with the girls and whatever queries that uh, the girls have is in india still we don't we are and like i said we are not really open about it so girls feel comfortable in, in talking of talking to you know talking about all these topics to girls they can they can better address the the, um, the, the issues so we, so they, they address the issues they tell them about the, the possible solutions and uh, after that once the seminar is over then we distribute them so that at least they know what they are doing and they know why they are doing so why they are, you know they are being told to do so so we are uh, we are working on you know like we are, we, are, uh, we are reaching out to different uh, groups and to different villages to different uh, you know uh, to slum areas we are going to we are also we reaching out to different government schools and uh, you know we are we educate the girls over there apart from that we are also uh, you know we are also planning in the near future to install sanitary napkin machines in the government schools where uh, where once we can uh, we will fill up the, uh, the the machine with the sanitary napkins later on girls can you know uh, put a 2 rupee or 5 rupee coin coin or whatever the amount may be and you know a very small amount in whenever they need the napkin they will they will they will uh, you know they can get the sanitary napkin and again they can discard it in the same machine in the other section of the machine so we are trying to install such kind of machines in government schools and we are trying to make them self sustainable so that whatever money those girls put in that that can be used again you know to refill the sanitary napkins and we would also request uh, the the school authorities to you know like if there is any any uh, shortage of funds in that so uh, you know the school authorities can actually help out we can they can they can uh, you know like uh, reach out to us and we can help out uh, you know in, in in refilling the those machines so we are trying to do that and uh, first once we are uh, you know good with the good to go with the with the plan and we'll definitely uh, go ahead with it yeah yeah and uh, even i think like this uh, the such type of facility not sh uh, it should not be only limited to a government school only because private school also need uh, such facilities and there should be a proper arrangement of such things so that uh, whoever, whoever is in need they can re easily reach out uh, to that particular vending machine or they can take a benefit from it so yeah uh, that's definitely, a uh, definitely. good initiative one of, of your project so uh, again my question is related you can relate it with either the laws related to women empowerment or animal welfare so my question is let's say if some uh, what are the potential uh, challenges or obstacle uh, you found let's say if someone uh, found that uh, for example like if we talk about the street animal right so if someone uh, hit the animal by, by mistake or uh, 
they do some kind of mistreatment with animals and uh, then uh, those who are uh, interested or those who are like uh, some, some organization like ngos who, who think that no this is not a good thing and uh, the government should change the ru uh, rules or the laws so that they can we can uh, give them the higher type of punishment so what do you think like what are the potential challenges or obstacles uh, are there in reforming the animal welfare law or is is it possible to reform any kind of laws or there is no need uh, to reform or there are other solutions to it like every society needs reforms every at every stage you know like every generation needs some reforms so you know, with with the, with the passing with the with the, with the passage of years, uh, and with with with, with every uh, upcoming generation, reforms are always needed in the society. Similarly, same goes with the laws. Laws are definitely uh, a part of the society that we live in. So we need reforms in the laws as well. So, like I said, we have the the Wildlife Protection Act is there, which is uh, it's an act of 1972. Then another law that I mentioned is the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act, and that is uh, an act of 1960, right? So uh, now these are again these are these laws are uh, you know very old and uh, they need reforms. So and, and definitely the government keeps uh, you know keeps bringing amend amendment and uh, with uh, as and when needed. However, I believe that more than amendments or more than any reforms in the laws. Uh, I'm. I'm not saying that the laws do not need reforms. We need stricter punishment for the for the people who abuse animals. We need stricter laws for that. However, you know, getting into uh, more, you know, getting in, getting more into, you know, making the laws strict is more important that we educate people and make people aware about those laws. What if I What if I tell you that okay, you have hit a dog. Uh, and you have broken its leg, and uh, you you say that the uh, I'll in, I, I'll send you to one year of jail, and you know you'll have to pay five thousand rupees fine. Mm -hmm. You'll say fine, you take ten thousand rupees and release me from that, and uh, you take ten thousand rupees, and I'll I'm I'm ready to take the entire uh, you know the the the, the expense. I'm, I'm able to bear the expenses of the entire uh, treatment of this animal. Release me from that, and uh, you know let me go. If he's rich enough. Next time he'll again do it. Right. Right. But why see why I know that how I will not hit an animal or how I will not harm an animal will only come when I am sympathetic to the animal and when I have sympathy and empathy for, for, for the other living being. Since ancient times, when you talk about if you talk about Sanatan Dharma, if you mm -hmm. talk about the Indian culture. Sanatan Dharma has always respected animals. Not just animals, we have been respecting all sorts of being, be it a non-living being or, or be it a non-living thing or, an, or, or a living being. We have, we come from a culture where even mountains, rivers and trees and everybody is worshipped. We come from a culture where animals are worshipped. Right. Our culture does not allow to kill even snakes or any other animal that harms you. But then, you know, it, it it's like it's just it's just the society that is uh, that we as human beings have become so cruel that you know uh, and we do not, we are and we lack sympathy for those animals. Where uh, you know where I was just having a discussion with uh, with uh, you know a couple of my friends and we were just discussing about all these things. So in Sanatan Dharma we have been following that you know even today even today many households follow that the first chapati that is being made in the house goes to the goes to the cow and the last chapati goes for a dog because these are the two animals that we interact the most in the society right right in a in a local society so we have been and similarly uh, you know even in this tradition has been practiced even today in in, in most of the uh, states in uh, southern part of india where uh, the rangoli that is being made, it is not made out of the powder that we get today. It is uh, modified for the convenience and, uh, you know, but then earlier the rangolis that used to be you know, made from the floor that was, uh, you know, the floor that was made from rice so that right. the birds could later come and feed on them. So we've always been sympathetic to animals in our culture. But nowadays I feel that somehow that uh, those cultural values have lost those, uh, the, 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 feeling of being sympathetic to animals, being empathetic to animals and to other living beings has actually uh, lost in our ways and this needs to be inculcated since childhood. So more than 
modifying the laws more than amending the laws or going for stricter punishments what will you do if you put somebody in jail everything if you put a person in jail for hitting a dog and if he lives our jails are we all know being an advocate i also know and if everybody in the country knows that our jails are already you know overcrowded right right so if we put another if we put uh, criminals into uh, people into jail for that that person might take it in a different way because reverse psychology works psychology is a very uh, you know psychology is very good but it can also be a dangerous thing if i put somebody into a jail okay and if i put somebody uh, you know uh, a person a normal person with a person with a criminal mindset he will come out with criminal mindset because he has lived with that person right so right. we don't we don't want to produce criminals in india we want to produce people we want to make people aware about the animal laws we want to make them aware uh, you know we want to make them you know a uh, better better human being so why not to uh, you know come up with something that will make people better so i think more than laws uh, more than amending laws or more than being coming up strict laws are also important but at the same time it is about the awareness and it is about the uh, the, the about inculcating sympathy towards animal among people yeah yeah and here i would say like being an indian we have good very good opportunity that we can learn from our ancestors right we we know that they used to take care of every animal whether it's a street animal or a wildlife animal they used to take care of and they believe in the coexistence of both human being and the wild animals together so yeah we we can learn from their work and we can uh, spread the awareness according like even if someone is uh, looking at us uh, at the india from abroad also they can also even learn that yes these are the things that they used to do since beginning so yeah these are the things that we can take care of and we can spread the awareness okay and uh, apart from this uh, deepak like we uh, during the research we used uh, we got to know that you are also fond of writing books and you have authored one book uh, the title is the uh, wilting leaves so could you please tell a bit about that book like how, how did you came to how, how did you decided to write a book and what was it all about okay uh, uh this is such a good question and you know this question has always been you know like very close to my heart because i i mean i i've, I've come across a lot of people you know question me that how did you start writing so writing was something that i started uh, when i was in uh, you know when i was in class 6 uh, i guess yeah that was in 2005 2006 so i started writing since then and that that was when i wrote my first poem and uh, when people appreciated it i was motivated to you know write write more and that's how i i started writing and then i started writing with poems in first of all so first i started writing i started writing in hindi and then later i started writing in english as well and uh, after poetry i started writing uh, different articles and other things and then i thought of you know why not to write a book so then i came up with a story and everything so the book uh, is, is basically talks about it talks about uh, you know it's a book on friendship and it's a motivational book so it talks about the story of six friends and how this main character prithvi he challenge he, he faces different challenges at different stages of his life and overcomes them with the help of other people and then how he becomes motivation for other people we we talk about uh, idea behind the book was that you know we always say that you know there is always a man behind a girl's success or there is a girl behind a man's success so uh, but but i personally believe that you know it's not just one person behind your success there are a lot of many people behind our success when we who just are in the background and sometimes we just tend to ignore them or we just tend to you know like forget them or maybe even if not forget we tend to you know like not give them uh, uh, you know enough credit so uh, it is important that we understand that you know that it, it is it is a family it is a friend it is your teacher then everybody so that book talk, so this book talks about all those things and it also talks about uh, you know when i say it's a motivational book it talks about not just the the regular uh, thing that you know some we have a lot of books which are talk which we talk about high value uh, you know motivation stuff we talk about how to deal with day to day how to deal with day to day stress that, that you have to that you have to have in life because most of us deal with that that's what the book talks about and the book is available on amazon uh, mm-hmm. and uh, at different uh, you know google books and amazon uh, all over the world it's, it's available across the globe okay 
okay and uh, regarding the same uh, topic like the challenges i would like to ask you like uh, for sure like we all face challenges in our day to day life so how do you approach uh, challenges and how you de deal with those uh, situation whether it is related to your social service projects or your professional journey like how you manage your uh, challenges see first of all uh, the you know not to panic okay the second thing is to be confident about yourself that yes i can do this so what i what i how i face how i face or deal with any challenges that first of all i take it as I, I actually assess that what are the requirements of this challenge whether i can do it or not whether i can do it myself or whether i can take help from somebody like i spoke about the collaborations so you know working in the society alone is or being you know being in as being in, as an individual ngo is also a challenge so we work in collaborations so first of all i assess what challenges there then i see that you know what are the possible outcomes of that mm -hmm. and and you know what are the possible solution to their challenges and then if uh, and later on if i if if i have to take help from somebody i definitely take help from somebody and if i can do it myself i'll do it myself right and uh, one thing that i always try to ensure that i do not stress upon any challenge that challenge that come across that i come across in my life because if i stress on that i'll not be able to come up with any solution right. stress is something that is uh, bigger and before you know like uh, for anything for anything that uh, i have to see about is it's just you know just work upon and and if i have to decide between if i have a challenge that i have to decide between two things or you know decide between this or that or take or take decision where so what i do is that i i explore all the options and i talk about the consequences of and i just see what are the consequences i list down the consequences of this action okay if i have to decide on this i have to, I have to go on this side what are the consequences of this side if i have to choose the other side what are the consequences for the side and you know the consequence you know whichever whichever side's consequences i'm i'm you know i'm ready to bear i think i choose that side that is how i've always been been dealing and with my stress and i've always been dealing with my decisions okay yeah so these are the some tips for those like who, if someone is uh, struggling from their challenges so they can utilize uh, they can try to utilize these steps or these tips in yes. their life in order to always seek out solutions. always seek out talk to people yeah, yeah. sorry uh, i always tell them you know i always tell people they you know seek out talk to people because talking and discuss discussion at times solves a lot of problems right yeah, yeah, I agree with this. Okay, and uh, like although we have various topic to touch here and to discuss here, but due to the limitation of time, I would like to ask my last question, uh, which is again related to our NGO itself. So my question is like, what do you see as the biggest challenges in bringing the positive changes in society for the peaceful coexistence of nature and human? Because this is something uh, around which uh, your NGO is working right now. Um, I would say the biggest challenge that we face is that human beings, we as human beings think that we are the biggest element on this earth and we are the top tier element, uh, you know, in this ecosystem. However, I believe that we are the, at, we are at the most bottom line of this element because we are just a fraction of this entire environment and the nature, right? And like, again, I would like to, you know, mention about Sanatan Dharma, which talks about the existence of the, uh, you know, how this entire universe has, uh, has come into being it's it's the amalgam it's the amalgam of purush and prakriti so you know without the without without the nature without you know without collaboration with the nature humans cannot exist and humans are i think the this earth will definitely survive without without humans but it cannot survive with animals or other uh, natural beings that we have around us so we are just a small fraction but but what we have done is what we have done to the earth uh, and then and then and the nature is sadly it's very it's, it's, a, it's a very sad so the biggest challenge that humans need to realize is that whatever we are today it's because of the nature and we need to and that's the reason where uh, that's the reason why uh, the natural things uh, you know the, the uh, we have been uh, in, our, in our sanatan dharma we have been you know very much uh, very much uh, like you know uh, inclined towards worshiping the nature and uh, you know including the mountains and the rivers 
I don't I mean, you know, when I when I talk about Sanatan Dham, I also don't want to say that I am an extreme right wing person, no, I'm a very neutral person. But if there if there is something scientific in our culture, I would definitely, you know, I feel happy to tell people about it because that is something which which we have which our ancestors have been following and which we also need to learn. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So for the peaceful coexistence of this, uh, you know, the biggest challenge is the human beings have to understand and human beings have to realize that we are just a fraction of this society. We are just a very small uh, you know part of this society, part of this environment, part of this nature. And we need to respect the nature and other uh, living beings. And uh, the best solution is that, you know, we need to be aware about what we are doing and we need to know what we aren't supposed to do. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Deepak, for joining us today and for sharing your expertise with us. I hope you also enjoyed the session and looking forward to stay in touch with you. And good wishes for the Golden Hope Foundation and yourself. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharmit. And thank you so much. It's a pleasure uh, to be here with you. And, uh, you know, we have uh, time constant. Otherwise, there are a lot of topics that, has, that yeah. you know, we, we could discuss. So, thank you so much for having me here. And uh, I'm, I'm really uh, obliged to be here. And uh, it's an honor for me to be with you and talk about uh, my experiences. Thank you so much. Thank you.